All right, all right, all right. So today, we're doing video, so I, I have to get used to that because we almost never do video uh, interviews, no, so we're getting used to that. We are very, very happy to have Mr. MC Lars with us. Hey. How are you doing, man? You doing all right? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing good for almost 2 a.m. <laughs> you guys came a long doing way. Great. Hey, no, but it was a pleasure, man. Uh, Thanks he, for coming. He actually, he was actually the... Uh, yeah, me, you guys. Oh, yeah, for sure. He was actually the first guest I ever tried to book for the podcast. Oh. Um, and then we made plans whenever he was going to swing by. And man of his word, always. To do it in real word. life. To do it in real life, even. So yeah. we got that going, which is great. Um, so here we are. You know, we went back then. We had, like, no uh, viewers and downloaders <laughs> to... Uh, we passed our... 4,000 downloads. That's so good. thank you, everybody. Who I appreciate you that. To, uh, we've had uh, Shubzilla, Bill Beats. We had MC Oh My. Uh, we had IQ on there. A lot of nerdcore rappers. Uh, we also had, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, Lex Lexicon Artist. Yeah. We had um, Kyla Massey, a, pr a pr K pop artist, like even for K pop, nerdcore, everybody on there. So we've had a lot. And if I didn't mention you, sorry, we had a lot of guests. So I just. To name a few, or else it's going to become the Name, name the Guest podcast. Good job, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, how, like, going back to the roots, the beginnings, um, when did MC Lars become MC Lars? How far back did that go? Well, I played my first show, um, like, March of 2000. Um, I called myself Lars Horace, mm -hmm. but I was rapping and playing guitar, and, and um, I, yeah, I did a show in the, in the church at my school. And um, that was the genesis of it. So it's crazy to be like next month is the 20 year anniversary. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Just like that. Well, congrats, man. That's, Thank you. Thank it's, you guys. It's a tough like just watching you guys do the uh, the the build up and tear down at oh. a show, and the fact that you guys do that all over the nation for God it depends. Sometimes weeks, sometimes months at a time. It's a it's it's a rough. It's rough, but it's nice to see you so passionate and still going after 20 years, which is great. Thank you. So. I mean, it feels like it's growing and it feels like it has its own momentum now. That's good. Which is cool, cool. you know, and then that, that kind of drives it. You know what I mean? If it didn't feel like that was happening, it would be really hard, honestly. For sure. For, for sure. Years. You got yeah. the drive. Yeah. No, 20 years of anything is a long time. Yeah. Um, so when was the first uh, maybe show or moment where you kind of realized that you were starting to make it? Because uh, you are pretty much a real pillar of the uh, community along with Mega Ran and you know uh, MC Chris and stuff like that a lot of people do see you as that premier uh, nerdcore rapper um, and of course as we talk with IQ nerdcore definitely go, has no real boundaries you know when we say nerdcore we mean like you know the fact that you blend ska hip hop punk metal everything it, it's really cool so around what time did you kind of like get some feedback or play a show where you were like okay I'm I'm pretty you know I'm something here like I'm kind of big already oh yeah thanks for saying that um Probably Warp Tour, like 2011 Warp Tour was big because it was, we were on a bus and meeting all the other bands. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that felt like a turning point. Nice. You know what I mean? Nice. That, that, that getting acceptance outside of the community. Right, and right. Those, those tours, I did it three full summers and really that was, that was dope. Because not a lot of, like Chris did, Chris did it. I did it, Watsky did it, Mac Lethal, but not a lot of rappers of that like internet generation, you know? For sure, it's a small for sure. Group. Especially in 2011, that still was kind of a growing point now, uh, especially considering, I mean, now you have so many uh, nerdcore acts and people who thankfully have been blessed with the uh, technology and, and the internet to kind of get everything across. But back in 2011, things were still definitely not as convenient as they are now, yeah, no, uh, especially yeah. in the digital world. And Twitter was new, and Instagram was like, that was the first time I was seeing it that summer. Oh, okay, People cool. People tweeting cool. the links and it was all... You are just like, huh. Yeah, what is this? And now that's just common practice. <laughs> yeah, now, you, now it's really, that's a defining thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, any uh, moments, uh, struggle perhaps, or, or a, a rough tour story that was like kind of like a rough gig, perhaps a, a rough show or rough uh, time on the tour where something kind of like... Uh, crazy happened, breakdown of the bus, or I mean, uh, vehicle or anything like that? Well, yeah, a warp tour, we were leaving Salt Lake City, this was 2015. Mm -hmm. Someone threw like a water balloon or an ice balloon off the overpass. Oh, it shattered the window. Oh my and God. And they said if it had been a few inches over, it would have blinded the bus driver. Oh God. And we would have flipped probably. So that was crazy. So we had to get Ooh, all yeah. out and... Yeah. The Warped Tour Caravan, we all had to get in other buses, and it was, that was intense. And it was definitely an ordeal. Yeah, and that was like a prank that... They almost went very wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not that great. Scary. 
Uh, have you all ever had the uh, curse that so many musicians I know uh, and, and know of, not always know personally, but um, have you ever had the misfortune of ever having your equipment jacked? Because I know that's always a scary, like, big potential problem on, on tours. It is, and I, I mean, we luckily have never had that happen. Thank goodness, and may not, because now I'll feel really guilty. This interview is going to be like, hey, after that guy asked him, it happened. You know, but no, that's a scary thing. Equipment's expensive. You know, everyone's yeah, rocking all be, these setups. You gotta be smart. You can't leave money or your computer in the absolutely, computer. absolutely. It definitely lies. All the beginnings of it lie in being smart. And we were Spose was on tour with us with MC Chris, and he was in uh, St. Louis, and his entire van got robbed when they, in broad daylight at a barbecue joint. Yeah, that's a scary thing. Some people would just go for it, especially when they see you're a musician. They know that musical equipment goes for a lot, or is yeah. hot on the. On the pawn shop market, so yeah, That'd be, uh, I'm, it's hard. Yeah, no, and I'm glad that you haven't. But like, it's crazy, and and sometimes you just can't stop it. You know, uh, Corey Taylor Slipknot had the thing where someone broke into his house while he was on tour. Uh, it turned out someone he knows uh, stole a bunch of expensive guitars, including I believe who was the member that passed away a few years ago. Anyways, I believe uh, the yeah Paul Gray, I believe his name is. Uh, I believe someone even stole some of his stuff, which he had found very sentimental and was very Sucks. upset about. Yeah, and the fact that it was someone he knew, someone that was very close to him, did it. That's. I mean, Ashamed. there and there are cities that are more dangerous than others. Absolutely, where, where you get where you just don't leave <laughs> stuff in the car and yeah. you ask the venue to watch it. Like St. Louis is one, Oakland. Like there's just pockets that are yeah. Rough. So you got to be careful. You got to be careful. You got to yeah. really just unload the entire van. For sure, for <laughs> sure. You got to yeah. It's a lot of work, but definitely worth it for the protection. Yeah. Um, okay, so getting into some recent events. Congratulations, by the way, on the Grammy nomination. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, along with Mr. Mega Ran. Yeah, you know, we were we met the, made the second round. We didn't make the final cut, but that was exciting. That is to get, exciting to get, um, to get shortlisted. For absolutely, it. not to not to shade the Grammys, but especially when you're not a super mainstream act, it really is hard to progress through that tree. So the fa the fact that you guys got even past any pr preliminary yeah. round is <laughs> insane. So congratulations that on that. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I know. Uh, with especially with that album, um, over the years, I know it's. Almost been like every time you and Megan Rand have teamed up, it was like it gradually built up with that. Yeah. Like a Telltale Heart, uh, <laughs> yeah. Flowers for Algernon. You know, so that was a really great album. And I, a lot of feedback I've seen online, you know, on social media is that um, the album actually got a lot of kids interested in the material that y'all wrote about. Hey, so, that's dope. Yeah, yeah so I think that's really cool. cool Thanks, know? man. That's the goal. That was always the thing to get people into books. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and it's it's really cool that you guys. I really love the fact that you guys, your material never like re, like recycles like in, in the t sense that like you guys always kind of think of something new and fresh. And yeah. uh, did did um, if it was a like even Stevens idea, but uh, I, uh, I'm assuming Megaran's background as a teacher may have had a lot to do with kind of that idea popping up, or was it you both could just kind of spitballing? Yeah, I mean, our first collab was the Telltale Heart, mm -hmm. and he was doing really cool literary raps, and we became friends on the MC Chris tour, 2011. You um, know, I hear that. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah. I was going to say, I hear that a lot. MC Chris brings together a lot of the community. I, he's yeah, introduced he does, a lot of people does. to each other. He's definitely, uh, he's definitely given the, given, helped like establish the touring markets with Nerdcore. Absolutely. Because he's, he's done a lot for us. So. We just, yeah, we thought we'd do a, I came up, the Dewey Decibel System was a name I came up with that I wanted to do for years, and I thought, why not, you know? Mm -hmm. So we did it! Yes, <laughs> and, it, and it is awesome. Thank you, Like, uh, that is definitely one of my favorites so Thank far. Thank you. I have a lot of favorites, yeah. I remember, I forgot which show was it where we bought the album collection, because you were doing like a... It was like a, the Corova. It was at the Corova, yeah. Rest in Peace Corova. Oh, that that place. Yeah, yeah, we saw, we saw you. Uh, they ended up shutting it down. It was um, a great just, venue. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that, that was yeah, one was. of my favorite shows. Yeah. Honestly. Like, Thank you. It was you. such an intimate experience mm -hmm. with everybody. Like, I think that was my first time seeing you. Was that, that Angel? That was a promoter. I that believe so. Was, yeah, Angel was. Yeah, Angel was promoted dope. then. Yeah, he was. He was cool. It was a shame. I remember uh, they were playing. There was that was one where there was another show going on upstairs, yeah, right? And y'all, y'all yeah. like raided. <laughs> y'all trolled the. Uh, you guys were doing the thing where you walk around through the show, and then a group of y'all went up through the other show and came back down. That was hilarious. And they, sit, they yelled, hey, Vanilla Ice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a metal punk show or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's I'll tell you, that, that's a rough crowd sometimes to, to impress. If you're not metal, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Great guys. Love. I'm from the metal community originally. You know, my most of my I used to do music, and most of my career is thrash metal. So I know it's yeah. a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but especially playing on Warp Tour, you guys have obviously played in front of all sorts of demographics, so that's really cool. Yeah, um, thanks, yeah. Any particular show or, uh, or uh, I mean, obviously you have a lot of uh, mates in the scene. Is there any particular show you played that's really special that stuck with you that was like a big uh, tour or, uh, mm. or particular show somewhere that, uh, other than obviously Warp Tour is a big, definitely a big turning point. But um, When Flow Like Poe came out, we, we did a show at Carnegie Hall. Which oh, was shoot. Wow. Which that was is cool. Awesome. That was cool. Thank you. Yeah, congrats. I didn't Thanks. even know that. That's a huge deal. Was like, it, it was the Scholastic um, Books Art and Writing Award Ceremony. So they had a, had us premiere a song there. So, and we had a string section. And <laughs> That's cool. And my friend DJ performed with me, who's from San Antonio. Nice. So nice. Yeah. That's, that's what's up. There you go. Yeah, that's what's up. There that's you go. <laughs> San Antonio represent. For sure. Now, uh, on the road, you get a lot of, um, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of sleeping when you can sneak some sleep in, because obviously there's some days where you can't, like when people decide to interview you in the crack of the morning. Um, <laughs> uh, have you had any time to play any games lately? And if you have, uh, what's been going, uh, what's been on your uh, playtime lately, if you have? Um, before the tour, I was playing a lot of Luigi's Mansion 3. Oh, God. Have you played isn't it? Isn't it good? Isn't it good? So good. I was excited. Have you played it? Not yet, no. I always get so worried good. when a game sequel comes out so much long after the last yeah. one, but yeah. I think they knocked it out of the park. Well, it's just the gameplay is great. It's fun. It's a little hard. I did a song about it. I did an EP about video game songs. Heck yeah. It's called Humble Bundle. Nice. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> That's you. an awesome, appropriate name. <laughs> Thank you. That's that really came cool. out like last, late last year, but um, yeah, that game is awesome. Yes. And I'm still in this, I'm, I'm on the level where you know where you're, um, you have to fight the piano player in the, in the, that's that guy's hard to beat. That's the thing about Nintendo games that I've always I've always admired is they can get pretty tough. Uh, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. I know they reported it to uh, Switch. I forgot what the exact title is on Switch, but um, that game gets hard. There are some bosses on there that make me want to pull my hair out. But like, it's the kind of like difficult though where you want to come back to it though. Where you die, you get frustrated, you put down the controller for a second, maybe come back to it at a later time and you do it. But yeah, no. And Luigi's Mansion is no exception. Like. There are some bosses on there that are hard. That's a good point. It's a, it's a game that's easy to pick up again. Even the Zelda games, like Breath of the Wild, mm -hmm. is, is dope. I also like the um, the Doom port. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That, that and the Wolfenstein, great. the Wolfenstein one is great. Too. Yeah, Wolfenstein, man. I'll tell you, when it comes to so good. Uh, shooters, it uh, knocks yeah. it. I mean, when it, I mean Wolfenstein yeah. and Doom are like the pinnacle first-person shooters. And that's the thing. It's a good thing you brought up Doom because I was talking about this a few episodes ago where, like, Doom is a game that, despite its age, what, 96, 95, yeah, something yeah. around there, yeah. I, it ages so well. To me, that, in my opinion, that is the best age the game OG of all time. Doom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very original. Everyone did the, the, the um, mods. Like, yes, and, uh, I know, and there's a lot of mods out for that thing. It's great. The, the community for that loves it, and it's still a well-supported game, so I really dig it. Do you know what I like is how the Doom and Wolfenstein have the same controls? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which makes it even easier it's to kind of get into. It's like they found their thing, and it may almost be the same thing, except one you're in hell and one you're fighting Nazis, but um, yeah. at the hey. same time, <laughs> hey, there you go. And at the same time... Uh, they still work so well, though. You don't feel like it's repetitious. Like, playing the next Wolfenstein yeah. after the next Doom is, like, a lot of The fun. story is great. And, and, um, it is. It is. You know what I like about Wolfenstein? Like, you, everyone, people don't like being political and blah, blah, blah. But to play, play a game where you actually can, like, kill Nazis and that's the goal of it, yeah. it's satisfying. It is. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. No one in our audience is going to have a problem with that. And if they do, you guys know what I'd say on the normal episode. So it's, it's just they're objectively that. evil. <laughs> yep. Kind of, kind of hard to argue that. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, being able to rock them in a game is great. Yeah. Um, even the newer ones, I was, you know, I was telling Josh, I wasn't a fan of Wolfenstein Youngblood too much, where you play as uh, uh, Blaskovitz's daughters. Mm. It's still fun. The killing Nazis part's still fun, though. I had more issues with the narrative being kind of weak compared to the regular Wolfenstein, because the Wolfenstein, the newer one that was on Xbox One and PlayStation Four and PC, of course. The graphics on that were amazing, but the story was pretty, like, gnarly. Like, some pretty crazy stuff happens in that, so... Is that but, the, yeah. There's the daughter who's... One of them is, like, a lesbian or something? Yes, yeah. yeah. One of them is her? Thing. Is that yeah. the, Which one is that? That's the... That's the... That's the uh, young blood. Yeah. Dark. So there's some, there's some subject matters that they do address in there that, like, some games just do it well where it really hits you in the feels. I know. Yeah, yeah. The, the stories. And Do you ever play Skyrim? Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, the Skyrim port for Switch is great. It's great. Like, yeah. to me, I'm really sad they haven't ported Fallout 4 yet, for whatever reason. Could, Nintendo, could the Switch handle it? That's the thing that a lot of people have questioned. I think if they optimize it just right, like how The Witcher 3 runs on there, I think it could be done with, like, dynamic resolution and everything, scaling yeah. back this and removing these, like, particular shadows. I think so. I yeah, think so. It, I think yeah. The Witcher 3 has really proven it. Um, now, the thing I would have kind of shown that is Outer Worlds, but unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, that port is being delayed. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, the studio in China that's porting it is shut down indefinitely because of the virus, so uh, I would have liked to see how that was going to turn out. That's supposed to come out next month, so... I guess it will. But, I had some merch. I had some die-cast pins, mm -hmm. like the Yoda and the Mole Man and... Robot that were made in China that didn't get shipped because of Corona. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's rough it's, right now. It's, it's hard. It's, it's tough. The world yeah. Is, yeah. It's, it's scary. Um, they had that footage of people that were going through uh, when they would get to different airports, and some people were just getting snatched out of certain flights and being thrown into quarantine. It was, it was really crazy to see that. Um, so, oh, speaking of video games then, uh, this, any particular. This oh, is yeah. Cash. Hey, what's this up, is Cash? Our dog. Cameo. Um, Cash is tight. Yeah, Cash is cool. And thank you, Tim, for letting us uh, into the, the pad to my record, pleasure. man. We appreciate you. Uh, favorite video game soundtrack? I'm sure you have several, but uh, is there well, any... The Quake oh. one is great. The Trent Reznor Quake. That's, Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's, a, that's classic. Yes, that's really, really good. Um, yeah. Yes, what's up? Yeah. There you go. Uh, any... Uh, any particular, um, the, the, so when it comes to, excuse me, I had a bit of a stutter there. Um, any particular um, sample or song you would like to sample that you haven't used yet that you mm. would love to use in a future song? I've been doing like parodies okay. on Spotify, which That's has been fun. Cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think samples though. I mean, gosh, there's so much. What I like is when a chorus of a song relates to another story. I think some of my best literary songs, like Hey The Ophelia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you take a chorus that's how a character might think, and then you paint the story of what else they're thinking about. So I have a ton. There's a... Um, Hot Water Music has a song called Drag My Body, mm -hmm. and I want to do a song about um, Anthony and Cleopatra, the Shakespeare play. Oh, okay. That would be, cool. be tight. So I'm working on that, yeah. There you go. That'd be really awesome. Yeah, exclusives. Sure, hey, exclusives. Yeah, there you go. If I could interject real quick, I did want to say, uh, so before the show, I wanted to find um, the albums that I bought. They're in a box somewhere because they just recently moved. Oh, yeah. Um, I wanted to bring my copy of This Gigantic Robot Kills to see if you could sign it because that's probably my favorite. Thanks. And I was hella excited that you played Hey There, Ophelia. Thank you. Because I fucking love that song. Thank it's you, man. One. It's one of the songs that, like, I realized the only way to play it is if I have to play guitar and sing the chorus. Mm -hmm. Because this song is such a rock-driven song. I'd play it with bands. And so I was like, if I'm going to pull this off, so I learned it. And yeah, I'm, th I'm glad you liked it. Thank yeah, you. That was great. I, I listened to that album uh, so much. And then also, um, there was a time when I had a huge uh, Cobra Starship kick. Oh, right. <laughs> so so that paid off. Yep, that paid uh, off. <laughs> on that, so. You know, that actually, 2008... Yeah, 2008. He was on Warp Tour. I picked him up, went to. He played, took him to the studio in San Francisco, and then brought him back that night. And Dang, so recorded it. So nice. That was that was so cool. And I met him at a festival in England, and I just went in and introduced myself because he had worked with someone I knew. I mean, I just had a lot of chutzpah to like introduce. Me. Walked in the dressing room. Hi, I'm MC Lars. I'm a fan. And um, yeah, that was dope that he did that. That was, that was a fun memory. That was my first time visiting Warp Tour. Was to pick him up. To do that anyway. Nice. So that's what's up. There San you Francisco, go. Yeah. Yeah, for Hopefully sure. I can dig out that. Yeah, and then we'll because we'll, we'll, we'll definitely we, we'll definitely want to hook up with you again, brother. And we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll hang out. Hey, and you if you're ever cool. playing in San Antonio, we got you, man. So. Thank you. Yeah, Gotta get back there. Yep, yeah. Yes, for sure. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so you obviously um, you do know multiple genres of music. You're not a one trick pony when it comes to your style. It's kind of what you're known for. Is uh, Again, being very open. You don't know what sound Lars is going to use next. Is it going to be punk driven? Is it going to be more straightforward hip hop, more chip tune, more whatever? Um, do you have any formal music training or did you just kind of start learning, uh, hey, I'm just going to pick up this guitar and learn a few chords until it becomes more than that? It's a very good question, man. I, um, I, I, yeah, I studied jazz pretty formal. Oh, okay. Well, that explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And I think that that taught me. Studying Miles Davis, especially the kind of blue record, mm -hmm. yeah. the modes where you know if this certain scales juxtapose certain chords, create a certain 
tonality. Right, right. And so, um, I, and I was in choir and like, you know, but I played guitar and jazz band and would go to summer camp, music camps. And yeah, I really, really am into music theory. And I'd like to do this thing with my vocals where I, when I do my, I, I tune them. So the main, your main vocal is like tuned in the major key and then every key has a relative minor, which is like three semitones below. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so make my backup vocals in the relative minor. So it's like, I think the best rappers are people who can take their music theory and, and apply it. You know, then you can make your beats. Like I produce some, like the majority of my own stuff and um, yeah, so yeah, jazz. I'm really a big jazz nerd. And I would sure. maybe I'll do it maybe I'll do a jazz instrumental record one day. That would be dope. <laughs> yeah, be sick, and then you guys can come back to this episode and say, Hey, that's when he said it. <laughs> all, the, all, the, all, all the juicy hotness coming in right now. Um, don't take that clip out of context. Um, so with, with uh, uh, that obviously being the case, uh, what other artists have influenced you? I know you got a ton of influences. Man, I mean, and just any, like a few. Well, you mentioned like that, that I like to play with different genres, which Absolutely. I think is a huge compliment. I mean, my all time favorite is a hero of mine who I've become friends with, Weird Al Yankovic. Oh yeah, um, that's he's, awesome. He's a gangster genius and he, um, he's a really good guy and just that he talks about how, well Lin-Manuel Miranda talked about how Al taught him that genre is the clothes that a song wears, right? Because a song is, um, a song can exist but, but you can put it clothes on them and make them have a different mood or feeling and that's what like I learned from him, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's like a cool lesson that genre should be genre like gender should be fluid. Like it should be that everything, it shouldn't be one thing because it's, a, there's a lot more possibilities. You know? right. right. There's more to it than just, yeah, it's not just black and white. Yeah. For sure. For That's sure. Important, yeah. I agree wholeheartedly with that. That's what's yeah. up. Oh. And, 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 uh, yeah, that was just, I almost, I wanted to stop talking after that. It was beautiful. Like <laughs> that was poetic. <laughs> yeah. That was poetic. Thanks. Uh, but man, weird out. What a senpai to have, right? I mean, like I if you're someone to look up to, that's the man. Uh, so how did you end up meeting him? Um, the short story is I, mm -hmm. I did a I did a, I would do interviews like and I would talk about him I, and I think he read something or I was on MTV or something like it was an MTV news talking about him and he saw me shout him out as someone who I said was I think I said I wanted to be like him because he's funny but he's not a joke right that's he, a good way to put it he takes the craft seriously and mm -hmm. um I had written a song called, you know, download the song. Yeah. And he, he was coming, he has a song called Don't Download the Song. Yes. And my song came out six months before that, before I <laughs> even released this track list. Mm -hmm. So he was like, hey, he said, thank you. He said, like, th he wrote me, he's like, thanks for the kind words. I think your music's awesome. And um, just so you know, like, this is ju it's just a coincidence that we have a similarly titled song. <laughs> and so then I asked him to play on the Robot Kills record. And then he, he nominated me. He was like wrote me in for best new artist when for the Grammys when I first started. Like that's you can amazing. nominate people, and he told me that. I was like, "That's great." So what a what a gangster! And we yeah, we've hung out a few times, and like when I'm in LA, we try to meet up. And that's cool. He's a, he you know, he's he's a spiritual guy and a, a a great dad, and he's been a good friend to me. And that's that's like so weird to me that he's in my phone. And right? Yeah, that's got to be something. And I get Christmas big. cards from him. <laughs> that's great though. So and he's like every nerd musician's like like. Jedi. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you know, yeah. I think we all of us in this room have probably said it at least once, and that's how you know you made it. If Weird Al parodies you, oh, totally, yeah. like, you know, like, so if, if Weird Al hits up a, a large song. Musician, you know? yeah, yeah, that's it. Be unplugged and then Weird Al parodies you. Right. So, that means sure. you're part of the canon. Yep, that's it. Yeah, exactly. You become canon at that point. That's absolutely the best that's way to put up. it. <laughs> so how's the tour been going so far? I... Yeah, you know, good question. Schaefer's great to work with, and I've really been, it's been awesome being able to headline and have, like, the ticket, the turnouts have been great. Like, tonight was great. Yeah, it yeah, hasn't cool been to see a, a lot of people. It hasn't been a bad show. Good. Like, the promoters are happy, and it's, it's really feels like a really cool magic moment that, like, the tipping point, they're like, whoa, we, we've gotten to this point where this thing has enough momentum that it can keep going. Yeah. Uh, sure. We have this wonderful band called the Double Clicks, these two women who do, like, funny nerdy music they're joining us for the last like 10 days of the show nice. tour and they're they're dope and yeah Schaefer's a delight to work with and um it's really easy to get along with and um I feel blessed to be able to have this tour and it's, yeah, it's yeah. a blessing thank you for asking of course man <laughs> awesome no exactly we definitely want to know great chemistry on stage yeah oh absolutely yeah, yeah. 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 that was a, that was a really 
Not to be like, to me, that was the perfect amount of artists. I think sometimes some bills try to overload it with too many people. I think that like that set was great. The three Thank of you guys you. really killed it. So. Three is enough. Yeah. I mean, we do the, the Mountain Nerd Core thing is fun because it's the four of us, but it feels less because we all really guessed on each other's sets. Right, you, right. More than four, no thanks. Like, I've seen rappers that have like eight openers. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, it man. becomes a bit much. And you know why they do that is because the promoters for, it's like a pay to play. The locals yeah. they force to sell tickets and it's how the promoters make their money. It's kind of gross. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the industry it definitely has its dark sides. Yeah. Uh, favorite uh, soundtrack uh, from anything? Movie, uh, video game, whatever. Uh, what soundtracks? Or one or more that yeah. kind of stick with you? I, I mean, so um, growing up, I grew up in the Bay Area. Then I moved, my parents moved to Central California, which is like Monterey, which is like south of it. Anyway, I went to school with Alan Silvestri's daughter. She was oh, in my class. That's crazy. And I got to know him over the years. But I love his work. I mean, I love the, the MCU stuff he's done. But my all-time favorite soundtrack of his is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It's my favorite. Ooh, movie. that is a good And answer. I'll tell you why. Because, like, jazz, it merges jazz with, like, 40s, um, like, 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 like kind of score music with... Mm -hmm. um, the Toontown music, the way, mm -hmm. talk about genre being fluid, that movie is so, he talked, he, he told me how it was like a really wild movie to make because it's so chaotic, but mm -hmm. the thing that keeps it together is the music. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was big, inform that was a huge like influence on me to be like, oh, music has the power to unify all this um, dis disjointed stuff into one one singular thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's like a really good soundtrack. It's a cool soundtrack. Yeah, it's it is really, soundtrack. really awesome. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I'm glad you used that word because it is a weird one, but a very cool one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a good choice. Hey, so, so far, no artists uh, that we've had on our podcast, I think, has ever overlapped. It's great to hear everyone ha choose a different piece that sticks to them. It's cool. It just shows you how important and diverse music is that, you know, not everyone just goes to that one song. Like, oh, everyone loves the whatever thing. Yeah. We all have stuff we all love, and there are those classic and epic songs. Sure. But it's yeah. nice to hear that when someone is asked particularly one, so far, different answers, which is great. That's good. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And then finally, actually, do you guys have anything before I ask the, any of the final Yo, he's questions? good. He's a good interviewer. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, from one lit head to another, mad respect for bringing out the, uh, the classics. <laughs> thank you, bro. What... What classic piece of literature is most influential on in your writing? Ooh. Well, I'm I'm working on an Edgar Allan Poe full length for this this year. Oh, yeah, man. So he's great because I remember really, you know, I I I was always deep into Insane Clown Posse because I think they're like very creative and oh, yeah. dope. And we had the opportunity to do the gathering of the Juggalos and meet them and open for them in like Denver. Um, but I like Poe because he's timeless. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. he's a huge influence on me because it's creepy, but it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So I would say Poe is my biggest influence. How about you? Um, probably Lovecraft. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Lovecraft's cool. He's weird. Oh, yeah, man. He's also a bit racist, but he's cool. I go, oh, yeah. yeah. No, I go for the spooky, you know? He's a big influence from Poe. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You can see that influence for sure. Yeah. yeah it's good yeah. to have the chain woes like Poe, Lovecraft, Stephen King. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, exactly. It's almost like there's an incarnation of them for each kind of generation, which is pretty cool. You know, it's funny you mentioned, like, Lovecraft, yeah, his racism, like, he had this bizarre fear of anything that was other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's, absurd. it's insane. And like, that came in he that was really came out through his racism. Like the character was where he calls the, the cat a racist name. Oh or yeah. Oh god. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I first I didn't know about when I was younger and I didn't know about the racist uh, connotations in some of his work. Yeah. When I read that part. I got really shocked because I wasn't really, it was like before the internet, so I wasn't really exposed to a lot of like absurd, I'm not desensitized like I am now because of the internet. Like it's crazy. Anglophilic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's incredibly, but he's so brilliant and, and evil. And I had this memory of um, one night Meg Ryan and I were on tour and I was, we were in Vermont and we stayed in Burlington by, uh, I think it's called Lake Champlain and it was like windy and cold and we got in it was like two in the morning I was walking like along the lake listening to his audio books mm -hmm. on Audible and I was like it was like a perfect moment I was like this guy is this guy is like one of the scariest yeah that, yeah it's oh, yeah. he's his, brilliant. his atmosphere building is next level it's, it's the way insane. he sets the scene the way here's what's cool about Lovecraft it's like Lynch in that David Lynch in that like everything's normal like we're in this garage but like this TV is 
I don't know, a demon. Like yeah. something small that, yeah. that disproportionate to what's normal makes it like increasingly evil. And I, that's like, his racism is like that. Like this great writer, but then the racism is like, oh, even this guy is like a messed up, horrible person in a way. And, and it gives us, I don't know. Yeah, no, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, it's the he's fact flawed, that he's a flawed writer, but a brilliant writer. Exactly, exactly. And it is those things, <laughs> those little, um, Things that he sneaks in there that really is one that little thing that's yep. wrong, and because it's like so small, it's so like it's like a it's that it almost sticks with you and bothers you, despite the fact yeah. that it's not even the main focus. Sometimes he's, he's I really actually, don't need. oh, I actually recall um, a video essay on that on YouTube where it did mention because of course the question lies like, can you still enjoy Lovecraft knowing that, that he's straight know, up he, racist? He was right? very racist, and that was one of the things that. A lot of the cosmic horror was that fear of the unknown, you know, like you, like you mentioned, like it kind of channels from that. Um, so, and, and of course, you know, yeah, denounce it, but you know, it's there and it's an element. And right. It builds it. And he didn't have probably a lot of friends, people of color in his circles. Yeah, he definitely. Would known that, like, yeah, he, he had like a very sheltered life, right? Yeah. He did, he did, and it reflects in that for sure. Yeah. And racism is just like not knowing like that. We're all cool. We're all like the same. So, yep. So chill. It was also weird too because he was very obsessed with um, like Arabian Nights. Oh, mm -hmm. he was very you know a lot. With you all know a lot. Up. <laughs> yeah, like, that's how he made the that name of uh, I can't even remember, but it's like the the Mad Prophet who wrote the Necronomicon. Like, oh. That name that was oh, kind of like his pen friend. name. Yeah, it's like his wow. Arabian Nights OC, I guess. Yeah, yeah. that's what's um, up. But yeah, I always found that weird, though. Like, he was such a fan of that, and yet... That culture, but so f afraid of people. At the same time, yeah. it was weird. It's very surreal. Weird. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, I did a Lovecraft song for my Patreon. Nice. nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, it turned out good, but it's about, it's about like... Yeah, it's kind of about what we were talking about. I mean, I it's a it's an interesting thing. Like, is he canceled in this culture? I guess in a way, but he's also like important. It's a weird. It's hard. It's hard yeah, to, like yeah, you know, it's weird. Yeah, yeah, that's what's up. But yeah, yeah. that is what's up. Um, and then to pick it up a bit to end it, um, your introduction to what the nerdcore scene is and kind of how you got involved in the more nerdcore scene type of thing. Oh, yeah. The, I'll tell you what happened. Um, I was in college starting the MCLR stuff, and um, there was this kid who would listen to my radio show, and he, he, he burned CDs for me, and he burned MC Chris's stuff, and some other stuff, and he told me, and he wrote NXC, right? Like, you know, hardcore HXC, mm -hmm. like, NXC, he's like, check this out, and I was like, oh, and I was like, I love this MC Chris guy, I can't believe he pitches his voice like that, and he's like, no, that's his real voice, he has right? Real voice. I thought so too when I first heard him. And that's, everyone's like, whoa, and so... Um, I met Frontal, Frontal I connected on email, and he opened for me at a, a show I did in 2006. But anyway, we became friends. But when I realized that I'd opened for like Bowling for Soup and all these pop punk bands and stuff, realizing that the first time I went out with Frontal that like you can have an audience, a smaller audience, but it, the, the, get the references and love it all. It's much more of an exciting thing than trying to like convince people who aren't into that stuff that what you're doing is tight. Mm -hmm. And to me, that struck me like, oh, it's punk rock because like. Punk rock is about being yourself and being original and being true to yourself. And that's like what Christian from the Aquabat says. Punk rock is about being different. Yes. And I was like, first I was like, kind of like, well, is this appropriation? Is this like distilling? Is this true to hip hop? And the best nerdcore was stuff that like understood hip, the golden age of hip hop and the technical skills, but didn't front and made it real. And I think that when I realized that that resonated with the fans, stuff that I was already doing. It was like, okay, it was cool. And then the community is just so supportive. Yes, they're very, they're, they love you, man. They love you. You're universally loved, Thanks, brother. Bro. That's sweet. And, I, and, real, and also then realizing that like, we could do these DIY tours and, and, and break even and then get to the point where, you know, survive. And, and yeah, it's just a really loyal, amazing odd fan base. And it's so cool to see the culture becoming diversified. Absolutely. And, and it was like, you know, the like OGs are, you know, it's, it's we're we're older now and see people like Samus and Lex and mm -hmm. Oh My and and Shabzilla and like and the new generation. Yeah. Tribe One, like, you know, it's cool. I like that we're passing the torch to like a more eclectic uh generation. Yeah, I'm no, very happy. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Your guys' influence has been 
tremendous on the scene, so it's really great. What a blessing. What a blessing to talk to y'all. Of Thanks course, man. Thank you so much, Mr. Lars. You're I appreciate you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Real it's been great. Guys. Real quick, can we peek on the, on the lovely shirt that Patrick's wearing? Oh, right. Yeah, you guys, if you guys are going to see him, it make came sure out to good. get that. It yeah. came out really good. Printed by, that one's printed by um, Hello Merch, and they're in, uh, not the, well, yeah, they do my merch, and they do really cool, like, parody designs, and Juan and Diego, were, Juan E. Diego is the, my artist who did that. So shout that's out. awesome. Nice. So yeah, tour exclusive, out. tour exclusive. Thanks for copying yeah. one. Yeah, for sure, man. Thank you too. <laughs> All right, it was, hey, it was it was great meeting you. Um, on, uh, well, we'll record the thing later. But anyways, other than that, uh, you guys will find you guys will never find out what that means actually. So ha <laughs> ha. But anyways, hey. thank you, Lars. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time with us. It was great. It was great seeing you. You know. Uh, man, you know, may, may you be part of the Disconnected Cast family forever, man. We, we always honored. hate you. Let's do it again. Yes, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Cheer. Take care, everybody. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Yeah.